Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm. I'll be your host. And today I'm joined with my good friend, Doug Hagren. Hey, Doug. Yes. Happy pre-New Year, post-New Year celebration there, Kirk, for whenever whenever, uh, whenever I'm talking to you versus whenever everybody else gets it. So happy, uh, happy Merry Chris Quantica and uh, Festivus. <laughs> yeah, I picked a, picked a terrible day to stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And if you don't know that pop culture reference, go back about 30 years. <laughs> I got all sorts of ones. I just listened to um, uh, Christmas Vacation, which is which is my kids' favorite. My kids are, you know, 11 and 13, and it's, it's their favorite Christmas movie. <laughs> like, it's still my favorite Christmas movie, although I do like the Christmas story. Maybe that's a little more nostalgia. They don't like it so much. But, um, hey, when you're as old as I am, that, uh, that, that movie holds some sentiment. So. Uh, Christmas Vacation is an excellent one. Elf is one of the modern, new modern yeah. classics. Elf is obviously. excellent. Obviously, Christmas Story. I'm still a fan of Miracle on 34th Street, uh, White Christmas, and, of course, the ultimate uh, Christmas movie, Die Hard. Yeah. <laughs> Die Hard. <laughs> Reginald, uh, what's his name? Reginald Belt Johnson or... Is that the co- that's the officer, right? That's the officer. Yeah, that's the officer. Yeah. yeah. But let's see, you know, we we you know, I know you don't want to make these political and controversial, but I don't think I don't think anything we're ever going to say for the next three hundred sixty five years is going to get people more polarized than declaring Die Hard as a Christmas movie. <laughs> uh, how about how about pineapple on pizza, Doug? That that could ooh, polarize people. Ooh, it's <laughs> it, yeah, those two those, those might rival each other a little bit. Good point. <laughs> yeah, well, we're we're starting off. We're, we're ending the year on the right foot, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, as as we kind of as we dive in here, really just wanted to kind of wrap up the year. We've had a really interesting year this year. A um, lot of volatility, a um, lot of sap, a lot of sap. Um, but a, as we kind of end up the year here, I think one of one of the things, and we'll probably do this the first episode of 2024. We do a review, and um, you know, because I think one of the things that I, I find to be most interesting is the fact that people are not in touch with what actually happened this year. And most people think because the market is close to all-time highs, we we didn't quite hit all-time highs in the SPY uh, or the SPX. Um, I think maybe on the futures we may have hit it, but but it's certainly not on the on the ETFs. So Bitcoin didn't make a hundred thousand either, Kirk. You know, a lot of people a lot of people failing on that one. To the moon, Doug. To the moon. <laughs> Stonks. Stonks. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. And what I find interesting is, is if you look back on this year, though, and without having the final numbers, we'll go over it next. Um, we'll go over it next week. But we started pretty much started 2022 close to the peak uh, of the all-time high on the SPY, and then 2022 pretty much went down a lot, and it didn't. It didn't end the year at the low, but it was close to it. And this year, we've had a lot of volatility. So it went up in January and then went down uh, into March and hit hit where the year started and then rocketed up until July and then went from July until uh, October, the end of October, went down. And then it, it shot up in probably one of the quickest rises we've seen. And if you look at the last three years, the market has basically gone sideways. We just happen to be at the high point. And I say this for uh, perspective, right? Because if we talked in October, like, oh, the world's going to end. It was like, I don't know. October's a time when the markets turn around. We talked about this in the show, right? And January is also a turning point. If you look at the last few years, what are the biggest turning points? Well, 2021 in uh, January 1st, the market dropped significantly and it went down. Stocks and bonds went down for for pretty much the next uh, 10 months and hit a low in, in October. So, you know, that was not a good year for most investors, right? And if we look at this year, people are like, oh, the market's great. You know, the Magnificent Seven's up like 50, 70% or whatever crazy number it is. Uh, some of them up more than 100% a piece. However, that was off a real low point, right? So is that, are they really up? Eh, yeah, they're up, but in perspective, it's 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 off of a low point. So it makes it look more dramatic than it really is. But if you kind of take a wider shot, you'll see that the markets are basically sideways. Now, I don't say this to be a bear uh, or to put a turd in the bunch, punch bowl. I say this for perspective, because right now the market is, or the SPY is maybe 1% approximately as of this moment, 
uh, 1% off of the all-time highs. Well, that's pretty close, right? Now, if we look at January 2nd, and that ends up being a turning point, and all of a sudden we're going to see another 2022, say, okay, well, we're still within the range, right? Within the range, you know, at this point, if you think we're going to stay within the range, you should be bearish at this moment because it'd be a great time to short the market because we're at the high point. And if you're the low point, you could say, hey, there's a great time to buy because it's at the low point in the range. However, if we break out of the range, all bets are off. And I think Powell showed us that last week when, when he came out and pretty much said, yeah, we're going to drop rates and we're going to get into one of the charts that Doug was nice enough to send about the market pricing in uh, how many rate drops there's going to be, which is to me just I'm just scratching my head. Uh, actually, why don't I just show it here right now, because I think it's, it's relevant. I don't want to come back to this later and, and miss this wonderful moment. All right. So here's here's the chart here. This is the CME FedWatch tool. Uh, with probability ranks. And this is based, I believe, on the market and what the market's pricing in. So if you look at the end of the year, the market is pricing in the most highest probability is going from right now, we're at five and a quarter to five and a half is the range that the Fed has put us in for the Fed funds rate. And uh, 37.4%, I'm sorry, that's not the highest, 35 Point eight is the highest, but somewhere between three and a half and four percent is um, is where it's going to end up the year, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Between six and seven rate cuts next year. Really, the only way I see that happening is if we go into a dire recession. I mean, a really bad recession. And in that case, I would say I could see them cutting even more. Um, but the reality is, is if they're going to cut it 1% or 2%, okay, I'm sorry, one, one, uh, one or two, cuts. Cut or two yeah, which is usually 25 basis point. If you, if you, if you go between 25 and 50 basis point rate cut, okay, I could see that. I mean, I think the argument is somewhere between five and, and five and a half percent, I think is generally where it should be anyway. Okay. I can see the argument, right? Because it's, it's meaningless if you, if you move it all that much. It's more of the direction. So you think of the Fed when they're raising, they're raising until they stop. Once they stop and then change direction, that's when you want to say, all right, now they're going to start changing direction. Now, the market seems to think that the direction is going to be down. Well, they might be seeing that we're going to have a really big recession next year. And that is the reasoning. OK. That that I could I could buy into that argument. Right. If we have a big recession next year, which I would argue some, would start somewhere around May, April, May, I think is approximately when the when the numbers should line up. That doesn't mean it'll be then, but that's that's kind of my ballpark estimate. Um, and if that's the case and we start to see it and there's some people have been predicting like 10 percent unemployment next year, um, which I think is kind of dire. It, it would for things to, that to happen, things would have to be really ugly. So we'll see. I, I don't I, I don't predict that, but certainly it, it'll get attention when somebody does predict that. Um so, but I do think that this is a good indicator because this is what the market thinks. And we talk about in the show a lot and how the market thinks that um, they think one thing, it doesn't mean it's accurate. They're looking six months down the road. And six months down the road is this June 12th, 64% at four and a half. That's, that's approximately where the market is looking. And that's where it's pricing it in based on the stocks and based on bonds. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. I, I think we this is a to-be-determined estimate. Um, people assume that the Fed was going to cut rates for the last year after they started, and they kept going up, <laughs> kept assuming they were going to cut. So I think it's maybe a little premature to say, yeah, this is definitely going to happen. But um, Powell's word salad didn't do much to to clarify what his what his uh, what his point was. So we'll we'll have to see what happens in January. Kirk, um, Kirk, I'd like yes. to add one quick thing here. It's like, you know, because I think you said there's like they're predicting like six to eight cuts. One thing that's really, really important to note is that is two to three times the number of cuts that the Fed hinted at. OK, so the markets, once again, as we have said before, um, even though they're now maybe on the same page in terms of believing that rate cuts are coming, the Fed is communicating that now that they might have pivoted um, and we've gone burns in as we've talked about right but still the fact that the market is declaring twice as many to three times as many rate cuts as the fed still is a disconnect even though they're on the same side of the fence and once again the market is predicting very differently than the fed has given and as you just mentioned if this is um 
you know, a extreme rate cut prediction based on potentially very heavy recessionary potential. What is also a very big disconnect is the fact that the markets and everybody is viewing this as bullish, right? It, how do you how do you go into this, you know, with all of these really bullish outlooks, but yet think that the Fed is going to cut rates, which they're only going to do in the event that the economy is so fragile at this point that they need to in order to, to sustain its longevity. So, I mean, there's again, it's just a lot of contradictions. Yeah, it's it's a great point. And, and I'm going to show this chart here and it's a chart. And granted, this is only a few months. So we talk about chart crimes all the time. I want to acknowledge this is only a few months. It's showing basically August until uh, close to today where the S&P 500 has a very close correlation to the 30-year treasury, which is the TLT. Now, I point this out because we've mentioned this in the show in the past. And granted, this is a very close correlation and it's also only a few months. Uh, so I, like I said, it's a chart crime, but I'm pointing it out because one of the, one of the, um, the key uh, indicators that we're in a new paradigm is in the prior paradigm, we had a, a very inverse relationship where stocks go up and bonds go down, uh, bonds go up and stocks go down, vice versa. So it's just something to note. Um, so if you look at, um, if, uh, if you look at the, uh, sorry, I was just looking at a comment here from, uh, from somebody. If you, if you kind of look at the, um, this correlation, this correlation is high. And if this correlation holds and all of a sudden bonds go down, that means stocks should go down, right? Now it's not one-to-one, -one. as you can see, it's not one-to-one. -one. There's some, there's some deviations, uh, things change. Sometimes one goes a little further than the other and that's okay. But generally speaking, they're in the same direction. Now, right now, as you'll notice, like bonds have gone down. Um, and I think even more so since this was, this was, uh, put up, I don't have the date when this went live, but, um, but I think stocks have gone up and bonds have gone down even since. So what this means is there's, if we're in a, in, in a correlated stocks and bonds environment, it means a diversification doesn't work, which is really important. Uh, cause if diversification does, um, hold up as it did before, it means we're back into the old paradigm. Okay. So there's only a handful of indicators you can look at and say, we're in a new paradigm. This is one of them. If you have stocks and bonds correlated, we're in the new paradigm. If all of a sudden they start to be inversely correlated, meaning they go in opposite directions, then we're in the old paradigm. The old paradigm is uh, lower rates, print money, stocks to the moon, right? New paradigm is, hey, we're not going to print money anymore. We're actually going to lower the money supply. We're going to keep higher rates. Different paradigm, right? And different paradigm, different rules, which means that if bonds are going down in price, yields going up, bonds going down in price, stocks going down. If, stock, if, if uh, yields are going uh, down, meaning the price goes up, then stocks going up. So just it's just something to keep in mind. Just keep that correlation in your mind. It's no longer this inverse correlation. So if you have a bond 60-40 uh, portfolio, don't assume it's going to save you in any sort of volatility. Because that's why you buy the 60-40. It's to smooth out the ride. We're not, we don't have that. Now, 60-40 has done tr uh, tremendous this year, uh, in large part because rates have come down in the last month or so. Uh, the 30-year, the 10-year hit 5%. Now they're down in the, the fours and threes. I think the 10-year hit 3.9. So they've come down a lot in, in yield, which means the price went up. And of course, stocks went up. So just keep in mind that right now it's still correlated, which means we're in this weird environment where things are different. And you can't assume the old inputs lead to the same outputs. It's not necessarily the same. So the takeaway from this is for all of you listening is don't make assumptions based on the last 20 years of, of the markets. Any sort of rule of thumb, throw it out the window. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you can't make an assumption that you made for the last 20 years. And, and go ahead. And Kirk, well, no, I wanted to add into that. It's like, so you're right. When you talk about you know, this, this, this paradigm, potential paradigm shift or, or are not making those assumptions, this is the second year in a row. So we've gone almost 24 months of correlate of somewhat of a correlation between equities and, and bonds. Uh, this, you know, last year, 2022, 
just a, a terrible year. 6040 got imploded because obviously the raising of interest rates caused, you know, fixed income to plummet. And at the same time, we saw a, a, a significant significant pullback in, in equities. This year, treasuries, I saw the other day, treasuries up 22% this year, long-term treasuries. Okay. So, and that rally has been mostly recently, but again, we've seen equities rally as well. So two years in a row now of running into a very extreme correlation between both equities and fixed income. And, and usually we'll see a, a you know, a, a temporary correlation that'll occur under certain environments. Um, and I'm not saying that two years is not temporary. I mean, it, it's a long temporary, but it could still be temporary. It could be a blip on the radar, but it's still fairly unprecedented to see 24 months, you give or take, you know, in there of correlation between equities and bonds. And that's telling you things are a little different right now. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I, I think we we always like to point out the, huh, isn't that interesting kind of things? Because if you're if you're looking at, we all make assumptions, right? We make assumptions that bonds are safe, uh, stocks are riskier. Uh, we make assumptions that, um, you know, right now we're making assumptions that uh, the Magnificent Seven is the only place to be. You know, we're making assumptions that the U.S. is the best place to be in the world. You know, we're making assumptions that the U.S. Uh, will always pay their debts. I mean, there's always these assumptions that we're making that are built into our thesis. And you have to make assumptions, right? It's like it's like a habit. When you wake up in the morning, you assume that there's going to be milk and eggs in the fridge because you put them there in the evening, right? You're making assumptions that you're going to get in your car and it's going to work. You're going to make an assumption that you get to work and, and your job is going to be there. All these assumptions we make, because if you had to assess every single little thing along your day, your brain would implode. You'd never be able to be productive in what you do. So your brain is, it, it's interesting for those of you who like brain science, your brain is actually uh, one of the biggest uh, your brain, I think, uses about 40% of the glucose in your body. So it, it's a huge uh, glucose suck of your body. So it, all the energy, it, it takes 40% of it just to your this brain. That's why I love sugar, obviously, Kirk. You know, Yes, my brain, yes. Yeah, my brain just needs it. Your your, your brain is, is getting too big, Doug. So you need to, you need to, you need to stop. stop <laughs> People have told me brain. my head's getting too big, but maybe it's just because of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> Still fits in the screen. It's not too big yet. Um, so, but if you think your brain, one of the brain's jobs is a cons conservation of energy, right? So in order to do that, it does, it, it, <laughs> it does one of two things. It, it creates habits, right? So it, it tries to simplify your life. So it creates habits. So things that you do every single day, like if you're driving to work the same way every day, you probably drive to work and you're like, wait a minute, how did I get here? And you don't remember the ride at all. Like that happens to all of us at one point or time or another. It's because you've done it so many times, your brain just takes over and it's not even thinking, it's just doing. And so you want to think about those habits that happens with investing, right? We make assumptions. Like one of the assumptions is the, the, the U.S. Treasury is the, is the risk-free rate, right? The, the global risk-free rate is built into the treasuries with the treasuries default. The whole global system implodes because it's all based on that risk-free rate. What if it's no longer risk-free? Well, nobody's built that into their calculus because they assume it's risk-free. Well, at some point it won't be risk-free. And then what are they going to choose, right? And so all these little things that people have soon, here's another one, gold, right? The, the, the dollar was pegged to gold to some degree or another. And then um, and in the 70s, it was disconnected. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had this massive inflation over the next like 50 years. And lo and behold, uh, it's still going, right? But at, at Prior to that, uh, people assume that, oh, well, there's gold's back in the dollar. W but if you tried to exchange uh, your dollars for gold, you would have gotten the window closed and you couldn't have gotten dollar, you couldn't have got gold. Well, okay, well, I assume things are gonna be the same. Well, if you look back at our episode a few months ago where we we took that that website, WTF happened. Um, I forget the website, it was WTF happened in uh, in 1971, I think it was. Uh, is that what it was? I'm looking it up. Give me a second. Yeah, I think it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. WTF happened in 1971.com. So we did an episode on that. And it's basically when we went off the gold standard. So if you look at that and you see the big difference, well, what happened? Well, basically, we were disconnected from gold, which means we could print as much money as we wanted. And of course, we did. And and so if you had assumed the old paradigm was happening, then you would have been confused for the first few years. I don't understand. Why is why are things different? 
Well, it's because something changed, dramatically changed, and you didn't change your assumptions. And so we have to look at this new paradigm, assuming we're still in it. And it's hard to say because if Powell starts dropping rates and going back to zero, we're in the old paradigm again. I hate to say it, but that's the truth. So if that's the truth, then we have to go back to the old standards. So I'm I'm trying to simplify this for uh, all the listeners. And I know it's a little confusing. But if you and we'll try to play, I'll try to put together some visuals for next year. But if you look at these two paradigms, old paradigm, here are the things that apply. New paradigm, here are the things that apply. And depending on which paradigm we're in, use those assumptions. Because if you're using the wrong assumptions, then you're going to get the wrong mm-hmm. outcome. Right. And seeing last year where stocks and bonds declined in history, that's happened a lot. But we haven't seen it in recent history. So we just naturally assume that's not what happens. But it does. So. Just to just to just a takeaway here. Is inflation getting you down? Do you feel like your money is worth less every time you open your wallet? Is shrinkflation frustrating you at the grocery store? Well, I have an answer for you. We're giving away free money. That's right. I said it. Free money. I feel like I'm not doing my part to create inflation. Why does the government get to have all the fun? What could be better at increasing inflation than giving away free money? No, I'm not an employee of the Federal Reserve. And no, I'm not an employee of the U.S. government either. And no, I am definitely not printing it myself. But it's free. What more could you ask? Well, you might ask, is it real? Well, yes, it's totally real. I'm holding it in my hands right here. See? Oh, wait, this is a podcast. You can't see it. Either way, I'm holding my hands right now and I want to give it to you. If you want some free money, go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. Follow the instructions and I'll send some to you. Enjoy your free money today. I'm not the Federal Reserve, so I only have a limited supply. This offer is good until I run out. Go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. We got a whole bunch of charts. Where do you want to go? We got like 25 minutes here left and uh, we got a lot of place to cover. So we may not be able to cover them all this week. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing for me and without pulling up any, uh, any charts and it kind of goes back uh, per per se, and I'll try to kind of identify some charts we could use uh, if we got the time. But I think for me, the biggest thing going into uh, 2024 is that we are in a in a, in a situation where there's a lot right now where there's a lot of conflicting data and a lot of conflicting opinions. As much as I've probably recognized or heard in the last in the last several years, I mean, we've got you know we've got people that are predicting uh, obviously a very bullish sediment uh, that you know next year we're going to come in. You know that I've, you know, there's charts that are showing that where we are right now, um, if uh, if we look at the the trend line that has occurred recently, that it could easily, you know, from historic data show that next year we'd see a continuation of that and, you know, into 20 percent, don't, you know, 10, 20 percent returns. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're also seeing uh, a lot of data that, you know, shows things like, you know, the, the bank lending continuing to tighten. Um, we're, we're seeing predictions, as you, you know, we talked about before, um, although albeit extreme. But there are some people that are, you know, starting to predict or see that there's going to be a rising number of unemployment. Um, you know, the Fed cutting rates again. People viewing it as bullish, but yet the reason they would do it would be bearish. Uh, we're taking, you know, looking at inflation being cut. But then again, obviously, a lot of the goals that they're trying to uh, trying to tackle here, which would be the elimination of this rapid inflation, would be something that they would intentionally, maybe unintentionally target. Uh, raising with a decrease in uh, in interest rates next, you know, and with rate, rate rate cuts last year. So where are they going with that? What are they trying to tell us? Um, we're seeing gold prices rise. Gold, you know, gold prices rising again, being fairly bear- bearish. A lot of money that's in the, that's been flowed back into treasuries. Again, treasuries were beat up pretty badly, you know. So therefore, is it a flight to just buying something that's of value, or is it a flight of buying something that's you know that's a position of safety? You know, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, home prices again, another 6% growth. I think I saw in home prices, 
but yet we're also seeing incredibly stalled level of transactions. You know, buyers, a lot of data saying that buyers are now interested in jumping back in if interest rates go down, right? But at the same time, with interest rates going down, uh, you know, with, with interest rates going down, you know, just because a buyer wants to jump in, doesn't that, does that translate to a buyer being able to jump in? Because we've also got data showing an increased level of stress uh, among small banks. Uh, 2024, uh, I think it's around March. They're going to, we talked about this in some past shows that the, um, uh, the bank term lending program, uh, the, the acronyms escaping me for, all of a sudden. Uh, but basically, we've talked about this in some past podcasts where um, in order to prevent catastrophic bank failures, the Fed basically created a lending program to lend to banks to give them the liquidity they need to avoid having to fail and you know, go into, you know, force you to go into FDIC. Um, but that's going to end in March, right? So we've seen a, a massive uptick in the use of that. Is the use of that money because banks are, you know, increasingly stressed and increasingly short on liquidity? But there's other people who are saying that one of the biggest reasons that banks are using that money is because they're able to make the arbitrage on the money that they're borrowing at versus the money they can make. So again, bearish, bullish, not sure. Um, we know that the big banks are are carrying a lot of things. That the small banks are showing an increased level of stress. But at the same time, the big banks, as we've looked at, uh, unrealized losses are also carrying their own level of stress. If there is a an increase in a desire to take that liquidity, again, if the stock market continues to, to fly, if the, if the data or the sentiment going into 2024 is bullish, if bonds, you know, fixed interest can make more money than cash, then that's going to start to potentially move money from the sidelines. We're still sitting on a lot of cash. That goes in the market. That creates a demand for, um, to the banks to come up with that liquidity. And again, this is what I'm just seeing. For me, Kirk, and of course, you know your thoughts on this, and you know some of the charts that you know that we that we pulled there that we've got available might um, might represent some of this, you know, or might be able to represent some of these um, uh, some of these areas. But to me, the biggest thing that I see going into 2024 is it is a probably some of the least amount of clarity and there's never clarity right there's always opinions a lot of opinions are in most opinions are doomed to be wrong but there is an extreme amount of data going to 2024 that depending on how you view it and depending on the circumstances of the economy and the way it plays could either be historically bullish or historically bearish and that i think is creating a lot of confusion in both predictions and sediment um, and consumer confidence and where to go in direction in 2024. It's a great point. I mean, here's, as, as listeners of the show know, I've been pretty bearish for the last few years. And um, it's in part because of the new paradigm, right? The paradigm has changed, right? They started raising rates. It's like, all right, it's time to be bearish, right? It's clear signs that, that the numbers are going to start, they're going to stop adding up. Um, however, Powell has just pretty much come out a week ago and said to the moon with everything, because we're going to start lowering rates with his typical word salad. So I really don't know what's going to happen there. Frankly, I don't know if he's going to lower rates, if he's going to just put everybody on notice because he sees something that we don't, we talked about it last week, you know, he must see something that we don't see. Now we see it. We've been talking about it on the show for a while. I think everyone sees it, but, um, but what changed in the last month or two that, that I'm not seeing like what he's, what his metrics are seeing. Now, a lot of people have been saying we're going to have a recession next year. That's really hard to say because people have been saying that for the last two years, we're going to have a recession. And yet we haven't, I would say technically we kind of had a recession, um, last, uh, was it two, uh, last year, but I guess, according to our president who can't string a sentence together, he said, no, that doesn't apply. Uh, no, the, the the things are different. And I would argue that even though his new nickname ought to be Mumbles, um, I don't think that uh, he's necessarily wrong in that this sentiment of, of whether there's a recession or not is different. It is different this time. I don't disagree with him, 
right? And so I, I'm I'm pretty fair with politics. Like I don't like any of them. I think they're all idiots. But I I I I am fair with with what he was saying. Like you know, do I disagree with him changing the definition midstream? No, I think that's bogus, and I think everyone should know it's bogus. However, he's not intellectually he's not wrong because a lot of the typical metrics they look at are different this time. And in large part, because we're in a different paradigm, right? We talk about that paradigms change. So what's different? Well, this is one of the things that's different. It's just like the seventies. The seventies was different. People didn't know what stagflation was till much, much later. It was almost after the fact that they knew what stagflation was. It was like at the end, they're like, Oh, we should call it stagflation. And then it changed and then they fixed it. But prior to that, they didn't know what was going on. And I think we may be in a similar time period where, we're going to start to see a lot of false indicators, a lot of um, data that that misaligns with where we think things are going. And this is what was a big part of the 70s was mass confusion. People didn't understand what was going on. So part of what we're trying to do here and part of the reason we did this, this, this second episode every week is to try to explain what's going on to people so that you're. Uh, more intelligent and you're and you're more astute about what's actually happening. You're not just saying hit the buy button, hit the buy button, hit the buy button. Like there is a time to sell, and there is a time to raise cash. And you know we've been saying it for a while. Like there's times to raise cash. Now would be a good time to raise cash, right? Actually today, as of this as of this live, the last trading day of the year, you got 45 minutes left. By the way, uh, the market's a little bit ahead of you because the market is selling off. Um, it's not by much, but it's down by a little bit. And, um, you know, and the reality is, is that if next year starts off with a bang, then we'll probably we'll probably see the first quarter will probably be pretty good. And then we'll see what happens after that. Now, if it starts off on a down note, historically, from a from a data perspective, it shows that we're probably in for a bad year. So I would say the first week or two is going to be very indicative about where the year is going to go. But I, I think people should be mindful of just how to think about it. I also want to point out this one chart because I, I found this to be really interesting. I'm not sure where my chart went, but here's here it is. Um, so the Fed, er, everyone in the media has been talking about soft landing, soft landing, soft landing. Fed's going to do a soft landing. Well, history will dictate that that has never happened. And the Fed is uh, has an a, uh, undefeated record of being uh, of being wrong. So uh, they've been wrong every single time they've said they're going to do a soft landing. Maybe they do it this time. The odds are against them, but maybe it happens. Well, the market seems to think that there's a 71% chance there's a soft landing. Now, is that because they think there's going to be a soft landing or because the uh, zeitgeist, if you will, of the market sentiment of everybody is in that place right now? Well, this is as of December 24th. And I would say, yeah, we're still in that place. People are feeling pretty good. We're at all time highs. Everything's golden. They're going to lower rates. Everything's going to be fine. Nothing to see here. Well, that may be true, but you can't make that assumption. It's way too early to make that assumption. So the fact that 71, if we hit 80%, I'd say that's a good time to, to actually bet against the market. Anytime people are all on one page, it means they're wrong. Just, just saying, this is probability wise. You're wrong if, if you have 80% of the market, and there, it's funny, I'm actually going to point something out, something I've noticed, is that any statistic you find, if you get any sort of survey, a survey of anything, it could be of tiddlywink champions, it could be what the weather is going to be, it could be whether you think aliens are real, it doesn't matter. If they're doing a survey, on the nose, approximately 25% of the respondents are going to say something stupid, right? If it if it's If it's like, you know, um, is Christmas going to happen on the 25th this year? 25% of the people will say no. It doesn't matter what the data is. Look, and, and by the way, if you don't believe me, go on Twitter, go on, on, the, on, the, on the internet, go, go to your TV station and look at every single survey. You're going to find somewhere between 20 and 25% of the people are going to have the, the, the most idiotic response you can find. I'm just, I'm just saying it could be obvious. Just remember, Christmas is flat. <laughs> yes it is doug <laughs> not for me this year <laughs> went in the red <laughs> oh man that was good i like that doug kudos to you, <laughs> kudos to you. i gotta uh, I, I gotta i gotta put this on after that one just for the end of the year just just <laughs> just for doug <laughs> i don't want my i don't want people getting into my pain this is too precious um 
but but anyway, I, I, I do want to point this out because it's something I've noticed and I just I just laugh every time I see it. It's no matter how stupid the, the survey is, there's always gonna be 20 to 25 percent of the people are gonna have the most outrageous response. And so it could be the hard landing is that, or it could not be. But um, but when it comes to data, it's 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 typically to manipulate you. Like that's that's the point of data. It, it, the point is to show a story of what they're trying to convey. It's it's rarely, hey, I noticed this cool thing and I want you to see it too. That's almost, when have I seen that tweet? Or what do they call it, an X? I don't even, they still call them tweets. <laughs> I haven't heard the name, the new name yet. <laughs> I mean, whatever, it's it's weird. But I, I still call it Twitter anyway. But if, if you look at that and you say, well, um, you know, is this true or not? Every single time you see a chart, it's like, there's a story attached. Well, you know, nine times out of 10, this has happened. Or, you know, it's obvious based on this chart what the result is. That's a story. No one ever says, hey, I noticed this chart. It's really interesting correlation. What do you think? That almost never happens. So there, you have to understand the charts are usually trying to tell a story. Now, I think JP Morgan is the one that puts out the big chart book every quarter. And there's like 300 pages of charts. And they also have a story along with it, but there's also a lot of interesting data points. Um, but it's just it's just something to keep note of. You know what? Uh, here we go. Here, here's another one. Here, here's the expectations of AAII members. They expect to perform the best in 2024. Lo and behold, more than 50 percent think technology is going to perform the best. Healthcare second, financials third. Well, I guess if they're lower in rates, financials should do fine. But financials haven't done all that well in the last few years. Um, but wow, that's a stretch, Doug. Technology's going to do well. Who would have thought? I mean, who let me let me guess, Kirk. Tech's going to do well. Tech's going to do well. Tech's going to do well. Tech's up to nine, and then Berkshire Hathaway. Oh wait, the same things that have done well over the last uh, ten years, every yeah. year. Yeah, it's just it's just push the buy button. That's all it is. Push the buy button, and you're going to do great. Uh, I'm going to point out one thing and then one chart crime, and I'm going to hand it back to Doug. So, because um, it was an interesting thing on gold here, I'm just trying to find this this one thing. Oh, yeah. um, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll have to come back to it, but it was uh, here's a what was it was. Well, I'll come back to it later because there's Doug sent me like 50 charts. <laughs> I'm trying to get to them all. So uh, I, I'm going to show this this one chart here and then I'll hand it back to Doug while I look for it. So here's a she's now I can't find it. Oh, here it is. All right. Stocks, price and gold. So there's two charts I want to I want to share with this. So one is this this chart of stocks, price and gold. It's the last uh, 72 years uh, since 1950. And shows a peak of 1967, a peak of 2000, a peak of 2023. Okay. And um, so the reason I want to point this out is they're trying to tell a story. Look, stocks, price, and gold, we're at a peak. That's the story they're trying to tell, right? There's a, they're not, they may not say it, but you can look at the chart and draw your own conclusions. Like, oh, well, obviously we're at a peak. So it means gold should go up. Not necessarily. So if you look at anything priced in anything else, the, the S&P 500 is priced in dollars. The gold is priced in dollars, typically, right? Uh, Tesla or Apple or Microsoft are priced in dollars. So it's not just the price of those stocks. It's also the price of the dollar. So when the dollar goes down, it means the price of these other things should go up in relation, right? And it's not one to one, but generally speaking, when you see the US dollar go down, it means stocks are generally going up. When the dollar is going up, it means the stocks are going down. If you look in the last year, you'll see there's a pretty good correlation where the, when the dollar has risen, stocks have gone down and vice versa and it's changed. Now, this is a comparison between stocks and gold. So the S&P 500 price in gold. Now, you might say, wow, look at how great stocks did. And oh, it's a peak in stocks. Yes, but it's price in gold. So gold doesn't necessarily correlate with stocks inversely, right? So if you look at 67, that wasn't the peak in gold, but it was close enough. Um, and you'd say, well, that was the peak. You know, gold had had um, had had actually gold was lower, and then it went up through the um, through the eighties, right? And I think it peaked in in early eighties. Yeah. So so gold was low, and then it went up. Same thing in two thousand. Gold was at the lowest point it had been in a long time. It was like you couldn't give gold away. People didn't want to touch gold, and of course, stocks were going through the roof. So that was an extreme. So it wasn't just stocks going the, through the roof. It was also because gold was at a low point. Now, if you looked at gold and kind of flattened it out, it would actually probably come around the same level that it was here. 
So it's to, when you look at charts like this, you have to realize that there are two factors, gold and the S&P. So it's not just what one's doing, it's what both are doing in relation to each other. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to get duped a lot in charts. And so, um, so th and then there's one more thing in gold I want to point out when I hand it back to Doug. Let's see if I can find this because there was a, a relevance in gold here with uh, that I thought was really important. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so this is this has to do with financial advisors. So this says financial advisors have seventy one percent of financial advisors have less than one percent in gold exposure. Seventy one percent. Less than five is a total of 27%, one to five. So that's uh, 90, 98. 98% of advisors have less than 5% in gold. I, I think the one to five, that's actually, that's a big number, right? 27%, that, that's higher than I would have thought. But, um, but generally speaking, I mean, most allocations, they put gold in there just because. Uh, but something to think about is that most people don't have gold in their portfolio. And uh, how many times have you heard gold in the news, Doug. Not many, right? But gold is actually close to its all-time highs. I think it may have, I don't know if it peaked out this past week because I was taking some time off, but I think a day or two ago, it may have peaked at the 26th. I, I, think I, I, believe, I believe it did. Yeah. I believe yeah. it hit its all-time high. I think we hit all-time highs. How many people have been talking about gold at all-time highs? No one. Almost nobody is talking about gold at all time highs. Two of them why, right here. Yeah. Why does that matter? I'll tell you why it matters. And this is why I'm sharing this. It matters because when you have a bubble, it's a bubble. You know it's a bubble and it's close to the peak when everyone owns it. Everyone's talking about it. It's on everyone's lips at the cocktail parties, on the news. You can't get away from it. How many people are talking about all time highs of gold? Nobody. What does that mean? Gold has a long way to go before it hits the bubble, the, the bubble-ish peak. We're, we're at the infancy of gold. It's like crypto this year. And I'll use Bitcoin as, as the marker. I'm not selling crypt, uh, Bitcoin, but just as the marker for Bitcoin. If you look at the, the peak, it was back in, uh, I think it was uh, February of, of 2021. Uh, was the peak, and then it was a close second in um, in the late 2021, and then it bottomed out uh, at the end of last year, and then it's gone up pretty much all year. Very few people are talking about it, but it's it's about halfway to the former peak. It's really gone through the roof this year, and so few people are talking about it. Now, if you look at crypto, because a more recent example, crypto tends to uh, be very quiet. You'll, you'll get a few hundred percent returns out of it, and then people start talking about it, and then you get a few hundred more. Um, but it's done great this year, and almost nobody's talking about it, which means that we have a long way to go in crypto before it peaks out. So this is, this is kind of an old, this goes back hundreds of years rule of thumb, is that if things are making all-time highs and no one's talking about it, you, you might want to think about owning it, because that means that the market's not in it, right? So if you're at all-time highs and no one's in it, Wait till people start talking about it. It's the end of the year, right? Gold's all time highs. People are going to see end of the year. Ooh, gold is all time highs. Let's buy some. People are performance chasing, which means you're going to get a lot of people rushing to gold in Q1, and you're going to get, and so gold's going to keep going up, and that price appreciation is going to pull more people in. Oh, it's going up. So let's put more money in. It's just like the Magnificent Seven. They go up because they're going up. It's a positive reinforcement loop. They go up, more money goes in, pushes them up. And it keeps going until people run out of money and then it crashes because there's no one else to buy. That's how bubbles happen. And that's that's something you need to keep in mind. So just keep that in mind with your allocations as you look at the year end and look at next year, how you're going to reallocate. Just be mindful that, that that's there. So if someone's not talking about it and they start talking about Q1, don't be afraid to put more money in uh, because you're going to probably see a lot more push in Q1 because not enough people have exposure. Doug, you want to wrap us up? We got to We got to take us home here. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to say, kind of going back to something we kind of noted, uh, I think in a previous episode, is that very recently, there was a significant number of, um, there was a significant number of um, money managers that had recently, only after we'd had a significant run up in equities, added them to their portfolios, right? And so a lot of times money managers will be late to the game in adding things that are already gotten hot. So 
when you look at that gold chart and you say, geez, no, less than 1% have a significant allocation of gold. Don't be surprised, like you said, is if you get out, you know, 12 months from now, and all of a sudden you start to see that a significant number of money managers have now, you know, 20% of them or, or a significant number have 15 to 20%. That happens. It's not just a, not just the retail investor that tends to follow that trend. Um, listen, you know, happy new year to everybody. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, just kind of want to wish you everybody for the, you know, that has been listening to us. Thank you for, thank you for being a part of that. Um, going into the new year, setting your new year goals. Um, if you have children and your children are in middle school, uh, it is not too early to begin thinking about what their future might be in terms of education, college planning. Um, it's really expensive. Like anything, the more you, in advance you plan for this, the easier it is to have a plan and the easier it is to save and prepare for it. So it's not too early to start. However, many of you are already up against that cusp. You might have a late uh, high school um, high school student and you're just trying to begin planning, go to our website, procollegeplanners.com. Part of your new year resolution goals, January, go to procollegeplanners.com. Download our free college money report. If you don't have that information, how can you make the critical decisions? It's free. It's going to take you about five minutes to do. It's going to be worth your time. Make that part of your January resolution. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, and thanks for co-hosting these sessions with me. Uh, you know, this is the this is the time of year for thanks. So, thank you for all your your tireless effort. And I also want to thank the listeners for supporting the show. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be doing this. And our primary goal here is to help everybody become better investors, more astute, and more knowledgeable. Uh, that's really one hundred percent of our goal here. So. We always love feedback. Please send your feedback, questions, input, all of it. The show is for you. It's not for us. So any any sort of feedback you want, send it in, and we will make sure that we um, we do our best to to provide you the best content in the show. I'm really excited for next year. We've got some great stuff planned. Uh, we're going to be adding a lot more things to the show. We're trying to make it spicy and interesting uh, to keep everybody engaged. I do think that next year is going to be a really interesting year for the market. So make sure you stay tuned and we'll try to define and, uh, uh, deconstruct all of the happenings of next year to help you understand more clearly what's happening and not just what's being parroted by the, by the mainstream press. So that's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us in money tree investing podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, wealth manager of innovative advisor group. We don't just manage your wealth. We make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.